In this video, I will write a proof for the squeeze theorem. I have already explained the statement of the theorem and how to use it in a previous video, which I will link in the description. As a reminder, this picture summarizes the squeeze theorem. If we have two functions, in red and green here, that have the same limit at the same point, and I have a third function, in blue here, that is sandwiched or squeezed between them, then it must also have the same limit. Or, this is how we wrote it as a formal statement. If the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l, and the same is true for the function h, and in addition the function g is between h and f, then the function g must also have the same limit. This is how I ended the previous video, and I will take as a starting point now. But I want to make a small modification to the first of the hypothesis. I am requesting the inequalities to be true when x is close to a, but not a. I want to write this a bit more formally. Saying that x is close to a is the same as saying that x is in an interval centered at a. So I'll require exactly that. I will say that there exists a positive radius p such that when the distance between x and a is between 0 and p, then the inequalities are true. And this is entirely equivalent, but a bit more formal, which will be useful for the proof. To begin with, like I normally do for proofs like this, I will focus on the conclusion, what I want to show. And I will write down the definition of the statement in that conclusion, because that will show me what the proof should look like. I want to show that the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals l, or equivalently, that for every positive number epsilon, there exists a positive number delta, such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta, then the distance between g of x and l is less than epsilon. That's just the definition of this limit being l. And this tells me what the structure of the proof is. I need to begin my proof by fixing an arbitrary positive epsilon, then after some work, saying what I take as delta, as a function of epsilon, and then I will fix a real number x, I will assume the if part, and after some math, I will conclude the then part. This should be very familiar by now, because it is the same structure as in other epsilon delta proofs I have written before. If this confuses you, I suggest you rewatch one of the easier epsilon delta proofs, which I will link in the description. Before going any further, one more reminder. During the proof, we are going to use the definition of the limit for g on the one hand and for f and h on the other hand, but we'll use them in a very different way. Because we are trying to prove that the limit of g is l, but we are assuming that the limit of f is l and also the limit of h. Why does this matter? In the case of g, we want to show the limit is l. Think about the definition. For every epsilon, there exists a delta, etc. In the proof, I'm going to have to fix an arbitrary value of epsilon, and then I will have to say how I find a value of delta that works for this epsilon. By contrast, when we assume the limit of f is l, there is nothing to prove. So in the definition of limit, for every epsilon, there exists a delta, etc., I don't need to fix an arbitrary value of epsilon. Instead, if I need it, I get to choose any value of epsilon that I want, and then for that value, we know it is guaranteed that there exists a value of delta that works. That's the difference. The same idea appeared in the proof of the limit law for sums. So if this is confusing you, I suggest you rewatch that video, which I will link in the description. Enough preparation. It's time to do some rough work to come up with the details of the proof. Specifically, what do I take as delta? I want to end up concluding that the distance between g of x and l is smaller than epsilon. That is equivalent to saying that g of x is between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. Now, I am assuming, this is one of the hypotheses of the theorem, that g of x is between f of x and h of x. So I will focus on trying to bound f of x and h of x. We are assuming the limit of f of x is l. What I can do is take the same value of epsilon that I am using for g in the definition of the limit of f of x is l. And for that value of epsilon, we know there must exist a positive number, which I will call delta 1, such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta 1, then f of x must be between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. And now look what I have. 
If I put together these inequalities in red, I get this inequality in blue, which is half of what I wanted. So this is promising. I will do the same thing for h. We know that the limit of h is also l, so by using the same value of epsilon again, we know there must exist another positive number, which I will call delta 2, such that when the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta 2, then h of x is between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. And now I can obtain what I was looking for, these two inequalities I boxed in blue, by concatenating together all these inequalities I have boxed in red. So this is going to work. But there is still one question pending. What do I take as delta? Well, in order to get all the inequalities I need to use, I need the distance between x and a to be smaller than p, smaller than delta 1, and smaller than delta 2. I can guarantee that if I take delta to be the minimum of delta 1, delta 2, and p. Because then, if the distance between x and a is smaller than delta, then it must also be less than delta 1, delta 2, and p, and I get all the conclusions. And that's it. I think I have figured it out. I now have the details of the proof. I will now write the proper proof. I remind you that what I have done so far does not count. The proof only begins now. But I had to do the previous work to figure out how to begin the proof. Nevertheless, I still need to write the proof carefully and in the logical order, making sure it actually works and that I have not confused myself with circular reasoning during the rough work. So here it goes. I fix an arbitrary positive value of epsilon. Then I use that same value in the definition of the limit of f of x is l. I know there must exist a positive number, which I call delta 1, such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta 1, then the distance between f of x and l must be smaller than epsilon. This, in turn, implies that f of x is less than l plus epsilon. It implies more things, but this is the only piece I need. Similarly, I use the same value of epsilon in the definition of the limit of h of x is l. There must exist a positive number, which I call delta 2, such that if the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta 2, then the distance between h of x and l is less than epsilon. In particular, this implies that h of x is greater than l minus epsilon. It implies more things, but this is the only piece I need. Then I take as my value of delta the minimum of delta 1, delta 2, and p. The smallest among three positive numbers is still a positive number. Next, I fix an arbitrary real number x, and I assume the distance between x and a is between 0 and delta. This implies that it is also smaller than delta 2, smaller than p, and smaller than delta 1. Since it is smaller than delta 2, I get that h of x is greater than l minus epsilon. Since it is smaller than p, I get that g of x is between h of x and f of x. Since it is smaller than delta 1, I get that f of x is smaller than l plus epsilon. And putting together all these inequalities in this order, I conclude that l minus epsilon is less than g of x is less than l plus epsilon, or equivalently, that the distance between g of x and l is less than epsilon, which is exactly what I needed. And this completes the proof. I will finish with the usual commentary. First, look at the pieces in red. Notice that the structure of the proof is exactly what I said at the beginning that it should be. And second, notice that all the variables have been introduced in the right order, that every step follows logically from the previous ones, that at every step I am only using things that had already been established to be true.